but it's great to be with you this morning. Who was here for um, Rachel's sermon last week? Anybody hear Rachel talk? Wasn't she amazing? Um, if you've not heard that, please go listen back. She's my favorite preacher. Um, she's also my wife, if you didn't know that. So that, But I think that would be the case even if we weren't married. Um, but she said, and, and it's very true, there's something of the Sermon on the Mount that it, it's just hard hitting. It is these, these aren't kind of light words from Jesus. He's not kind of having a bit of a jolly in this, this moment. And um, I guess there's a reality of today as we open the word of God together, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount and continue in this series. Um, I want to encourage you to prepare your heart for, for God to speak. Because that's actually a conscious thing we can do. I don't know if you know that. We can sit and we can kind of just listen and then we can walk away. Or we can sit and go, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me today? Holy Spirit, how do you want to connect your word with my reality and lead me into the truth? I would love to encourage you to, to do so as we open up the word of, of God today. There is an intensity. There is something of a, at times, a smack in the face that the Sermon on the Mount gives us when we actually kind of step back and, and allow it to. And, um, and I've known that in lots of ways over the last few weeks. In fact, I've, we've not just been looking at the Sermon on the Mount as a life group now for the kind of the last four weeks. I think we're on week 16 of the Sermon on the Mount as a, a life group. And we've been doing one section um, per week. And, and each week in one way or another, it's, it's, I mean, lovingly, but smacks me in the face in one way and just woken me up a bit to be like, oh God, this is who you are. And this is who you're calling me to be and what it means to be a disciple of yours, Jesus, and, and how to follow you. And, and I pray that that would be the case today in his loving, tender, gentle kind of way. When I was about 17, I, uh, I got the opportunity to visit a church in Romania and just, uh, I suppose, support them and, and try to help with some of the stuff they were doing. And, and on my way back, we flew via um, Amsterdam so we kind of had an interconnecting flight and I jumped on that interconnecting flight to come back to Manchester, which was about an hour and a half from where uh, I lived growing up. And um, jumped on the flight, sat myself down, other people were walking in and I was like, great, got my seat, I'm happy. Kind of got my phone or whatever it was out to start to read. And, um, and then a guy kind of stands right in front of me quite awkwardly. I was on the um, aisle seat and he was like, oh, you're, you're sat in my seat. Now, as a 17 year old, I wasn't lacking confidence. Some might say I was cocky, but let's just say I, I didn't lack confidence. And I sat there being like, oh no, I'm definitely sat in the right seat. And he was like, no, you're sat in my seat. And he was quite a bit older than me. And I was like, okay. And then he said, can you show me your ticket? To which I'm like, gosh, who is this guy? I mean, but I was like, willingly taking my ticket out, drawing it out like a sword to prove my GCSE English standard of reading. And I showed him my ticket and he got the ticket in front of him and he said, oh, you are in the right seat. To which I went, yes, thank you very much. And then he said, but you're on the wrong plane. which meant I had to run off the plane. My name is being shouted out over the tannoy, Mr. Andy Waldridge, final call for Manchester. And I had to do the walk of shame down the aisle whilst everyone else was sat waiting for me. Uh, gosh. There's a reality that we can read the Sermon on the Mount and we can be passionate followers of Jesus. We can know the truth. We can hold to the truth. We can be confident in our truth and in our walk with Jesus. But can I say this to you? If you are not heading in the direction of love, you are on the wrong plane. In your discipleship to Jesus, you can know all the truth. You can be so committed, so dedicated, so disciplined in all that you do. But if you are not in the direction of love, you are on the wrong plane. Jesus is always going in the direction of love. Of love. If you've got your Bibles with me, open to Matthew 5. I just want to glance really quickly and show you how this is the case. And we haven't got time to do this all the way. But um, after this stunning intro of the Beatitudes, we then get onto this passage about the salt and light. 
can I say this to you? If you want to be salt and light, if you want to be countercultural in your workplace, in your home, in your family, with your friends, the most countercultural thing you can do is to be sacrificially loving. It's to love without expecting anything in return. That's what Jesus is saying. We go to the next passage, verse 17. It starts talking about the fulfillment of the law. The fulfillment of the law that Jesus would later say, actually, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the fulfillment of the law. We get to murder, verse 21. I don't say this lightly, but it's really hard to murder somebody and to love them at the same time. Just saying. Adultery, pretty similar. It's really hard to be like, actually, I am loving somebody in this moment. I'm loving somebody and to commit adultery or to lust after somebody. Love overcomes it. Divorce. To love somebody is not to flippantly, which was what this is talking about, just flippantly casting them aside for my convenience. You can't love somebody and flippantly cast them aside for your own convenience. Oaths. This was all about about being trustworthy to your word, about letting your yes be your yes and your no be your no. If you choose to love the person in front of you, you will have integrity about the way you speak to them and the way you promise, the things you promise. An eye for eye and a tooth for tooth. You will not seek revenge against somebody if you're choosing to love them. Finally, love for your enemies. Oh, that does what it says in the tin, doesn't it? Do you understand what I'm saying? The whole of the Sermon on the Mount is basically Jesus going, love the person in front of you. Love them like I love them. Love them in a sacrificial way. Love them in a way that costs you. Love them in a way that I love you. Because he's more loving than what we could ever imagine. He's more loving than we could ever imagine. And this is the life of discipleship to Jesus. It's a life of, of receiving his love, of recognizing his love and allowing it to heal and to shape and to change us and to, to draw us close to him, but also to, to mend us and to make us more like Jesus so that then we can love other people, not just so that we can live a great life, but so that we can show his love to others. This summarizes the whole of the law and the prophets. So then you get to the end of Matthew 5 and it says these words. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Good luck with that, church. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous bar to set. He says, love your enemies, and then he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That word perfect, actually, is, is probably better translated, fully mature. Fully mature into that which God has created you to be, just as your Father in heaven is, is fully mature. And what is full maturity? It's somebody shaped by the love of God and then living out that love to others. This is the call of the gospel. This is discipleship to Jesus. But as we've gone through our life group in the last 16 weeks or so, time and time again, we found ourselves saying, I could never do that. I could never do that in my own strength. I, 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 just, I struggle to really, really love my wife at times, yet alone my enemies. She's not my enemy. Uh, I, I struggle, the idea of being perfect, of, of making myself whole, I, I can't do it. And there's something in this call, both of the whole of the Sermon on the Mount and of our discipleship to Jesus, that we're not meant to do this in our own strength. He is setting a standard, a bar too high for us to reach ourselves. He's calling us to le learn to lean on his grace, to lean upon his spirit, to lean upon truth rather than our own wisdom, not to rely on our own understanding. So, there's the intro. Let's jump today to our passage, which is Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. I'll give you a moment to turn to it. And it says this. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the spot speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You 
hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. This uh, Greek word is the word krino. I'm sure I mispronounced that. Forgive me, any Greek scholars out there. Um, But this word is actually used five times in these first two sentences. It's probably better translated as, as, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the judgment that you use to judge others, you will be judged. Jesus is trying to get a point across here about this word judge. What it doesn't mean is you need to switch off your brain and your discernment to to what is right and wrong. He's he's not saying, oh, just let anything be. There's no right and wrong. Just stop judging people. He's not saying switch off your brain. Uh, uh, A discerning mind, uh, uh, actually a a critical mind, something that's able to critique between right and wrong is is a godly thing. It's part of what wisdom is. He's not saying turn off your brain. As with so much of the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying, what's going on in your heart? Because there's a difference between a critical mind, which is able to discern between right and wrong, and a critical heart, which is always looking for the wrong in people, in circumstances. I think often the difference between those two things is, is whether we live equally and fully <laughs> within grace and truth. Within grace and truth, this is how Jesus came. Fully in grace and fully in truth. And this is how we're meant to live. This is what softens our hearts all the time and yet keeps our hearts strong to live in grace and in truth. So this word, this idea is not saying switch off your mind. What it is saying is don't put yourself in the position of condemning others. In fact, this this Greek word almost paints a picture of taking the higher ground, of of enthroning yourself above somebody else or above a circumstance in order to judge it and more significantly to condemn it. To enthrone yourself, to cast judgment on something or someone, but in a position of power that they might not cast judgment back upon you. One commentator of Matthew described it as the presumptuous ambition to be God by setting ourselves up as judges. It's pretty strong, isn't it? The presumptuous ambition to be God by setting ourselves up as judges. When we start thinking of this passage, do not judge or you too will be judged. Like that, we begin to hear that, that Jesus is actually calling us this passage to to dethrone ourselves to dethrone ourselves the throne that we love to step upon James 4 verse 11 and 12 says brothers and sisters do not slander one another anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it and when you judge the law you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it there is only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? That is, who are you to set yourself up on a throne to cast judgment on another? I think this is linked with that first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The humble, those who recognize their need for God and for others, those who don't set themselves on on a pedestal or on a throne, but who recognize their lack and their brokenness. And in this place, the poor in spirit will receive the kingdom of God. Because it's only in that place when you you can walk in the life and the fullness of the kingdom of God, because we can't sit on a throne in control, in power, in that sense of self-security and live within his kingdom where only he can be on the throne. Philippians 2, many of you will recognize this passage. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value yourselves, sorry, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, 
did not equal, in consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He did not enthrone himself. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus literally did the opposite of putting himself on the throne above others. What does this look like for us? Well, I, I don't consciously step up on a golden throne and cast my judgments on other people. I don't know about you, but that's, it's generally a bit more subtle for me. Um, went to a fine burger establishment with the family yesterday for lunch. Um, I won't tell you which one it was, but it wasn't a dishonest burger. And we sat there, and, um, and the waiter, the male waiter, was wearing, in my opinion, what was a ridiculous outfit. Just inappropriate in any setting, but particularly in a restaurant to serve me my food. And I was so quick to be like, Rach, Rach, look behind you. You would not guess what a waiter is wearing. Like, look behind you. And as I did so, I was like, whoa. How quick am I to cast judgment on another? I, it's just his clothes. It's not a big deal. But, but what went on, actually, in my heart in that moment? Well, I, I set myself up on a throne, and I, de I decided that the decision somebody else had made was a bad decision and that I would have made a better decision. Do you ever find yourself doing that? <laughs> In that moment, I was, if I'm really honest, I was probably mildly offended. And, and, and more than that, actually, I wanted to tell Rach so that she could validate my offense. And how quickly does that become gossip and the purpose of gossip? Just like validate my, my, my mild or, or big offense. What else went on in my heart? Well, I entirely had ignored that this person in front of me was made in the image of God. I was deeply, deeply loved by God. In fact, Ephesians 2 tells me about him, that he's God's workmanship created by God. It's God's poetry in motion. And I was entirely blinded by that because I put myself on the throne and I cast judgment on him. What does this look like for you? How about that annoying person at work? How about that awkward person in your friendship group? And it's not that you condemn them, but you just kind of keep them at arm's length. How about that Christian who believes differently to you? How about that Christian who believes differently to you about gay marriage? Let's bring it into this moment. Or that leader, that Christian leader who believes differently to you about that? How about people who are from a different social economic background to you? How about people, and this gets me, this gets me a lot. How about people who are seemingly more successful than you? Oh, I find myself, if I see somebody more successful than me or what I believe is more successful, I'm like, gosh, they're not using their success as they could. If I were in that situation, I would be far more generous than what they are. I'd be far more graceful than they are. Gosh, I would use those opportunities in far holier ways than what they are. And I put myself on a throne. How about people who are less successful than you? People who you would class as incompetent or just keep making mistakes. What's going on in your heart towards them? Jesus isn't asking us to switch off our discernment in all of these things. It may have been inappropriate for him to have worn those clothes. But what he is asking us to do is to get off our thrones and to love like he loves. There's so many things we could touch on here and, and we don't have time, but what about social media? It's just like a hurricane, a hurricane of comparison and, and judgment. Can I just give some of you permission today? I suspect, and I've not done the exact maths, but I suspect 90% plus of people in this room, you actually don't need to be on social media to live in the fullness of God's purposes for your life. 
You don't. You just don't need to be. It's okay if you miss out on what some other people say. And that's, please don't hear me wrong. Actually, for some people, it's absolutely fine for you to be on social media, it, honestly. But, but you don't have to be. How about gossip? Guys, gossip is, is probably one of the main ways that the world works out judgment on others. And it's absolutely savage. If you've ever experienced it, you know how savage it is. If you've not experienced it for a long time, you may have forgotten how brutal it actually is. But not in the church, guys. Not in the church. We can't stand here and, and praise God and then leave this place and, and talk about people who are made in the image of that same God you've been praising. One of the most countercultural things we can do, we can be in the world, is people who walk away from gossip. People who refuse to speak badly about others behind their back. And absolutely, that's awkward to walk away from a conversation sometimes. Absolutely, it's awkward to change the conversation. But it's powerful and it's loving and it's what discipleship to Jesus looks like. So, in the last 10 minutes or so, how do we dethrone ourselves? How do we dethrone ourselves and stop casting judgment on others? Matthew 5 verse three and five, these last few verses says this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus used this word hypocrite quite often, and mostly towards the Pharisees of his day. They were the religious elite of Jesus' day. And if you ever want to read a convicting passage about yourself, then go through Matthew 23 and say, Jesus, how am I like this? He basically just goes through all the ways that the, the Pharisees are. He talks about how they fail to practice what they preach. That is, their talk is bigger than their walk. He talks about how they choose legalism and control over compassion feels like the opposite to Jesus' life. He talks about how they're proud and self-righteous in their attitudes. Think about that story in Luke 18 where the Pharisee and the tax collector pray together and the Pharisee is like, God, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. He's enthroned himself to cast judgment on another. And Jesus talks about how they're always concerned about the outward performance rather than the inner purity. This word hypocrite can literally be translated from the Greek an actor performing on the stage. An actor performing on the stage. And um, this hits home really hard for me. And it has done for a few months now. I felt like a few months ago, Jesus basically said to me, Andy, you're a Pharisee in so many ways. And I was like, oh, sucker punch. Like, God, what does that mean? And he was like, Andy, you actually don't know who you are. You don't know all the things that are going on inside your heart. You've so suppressed and repressed your, your fears and your anxieties and your concerns. You've, you've not brought them to me. And, and now, now your life, it's not that you're deliberately trying to deceive others, but you're so unaware of who you are that your life has become a performance. And these last few months, have been a, a brutal and, and beautiful journey of being like, okay, God, then what's really going on inside of me? And what do you speak into that? How do you want to deal with that? Genesis 3 verse 9, God asks Adam, where are you? He knew where he was. But I wonder if he asks each one of us today, Really, where are you? Do you know where your heart's at? Do you know what's going on inside of you? Or, or have you, like me for so long, just begun to live a lifestyle that numbs yourself to all that's going on? Numbs yourself through entertainment and through comfort, through food, through relationships. Numbs ourselves to the 
to the pain, numbs ourselves to the fears, numbs ourselves to the insecurities or the ego and the pride. This idea in verse five of those who are paying no attention to the plank in your own eye is nowhere near strong enough to what Jesus says in the original language. It says this, it means it's an intensity of consideration and contemplation. It's a thorough investigation resulting in a complete understanding of what is going on in the plank in your eye. I think that I've spent a lot of my life probably kind of aware of my faults and have excused them as kind of being like, oh, it's just who I am. Anybody ever done that? It's just, it's just my personality. Just like, it's just how God wired me. It's just, it's just what I do. And never actually dug into what is actually going on inside of me to be insecure like that. What is actually going on inside of me to enthrone myself above others and judge them like that. When Jesus says they pay no attention to the plank in their own eye, he's saying, he said, do a thorough investigation an intense consideration and contemplation of what's going on inside of you and do it with me. Journey with me in this. I know actually for many of us in this room, this is what the Holy Spirit has been doing recently. And it's been brutal and beautiful at the same time. As he's been digging deeper into our hearts and wanting to pour his love into places which we have just suppressed or repressed. Paul had his love into places which, which we don't even want to know about. And yet he knows. His love goes deep enough. A few weeks back, Rachel said to me, my wife Rachel said to me, Andy, I think this is the most insecure I've ever known you. I mean, she didn't even do like a feedback sandwich. She didn't say something nice beforehand. Andy, your beard is so nice at the moment. You're the most insecure I've ever met you, but you're a great father to our children. Like, no, no, she didn't do the sandwich thing. That was it. That was the whole of her sentence. Andy, I think you're the most insecure I've ever known you. And in lots of ways, she's wrong. This is just the most insecure I've ever shown her. This is the most insecure that I've allowed God to dig up from my heart. It's always been there, but I've just hidden it. I've masked it. I've put on a performance, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously, some, sometimes subconsciously. And God's bringing it to the surface to heal and to restore. He's bringing it to the surface in his love because he's got better plans for my life and he's got better plans for your life. And those plans are always around your wholeness, around your restoration, so that actually I no longer have to put myself on a throne to judge others in order to feel powerful. So I don't have to put myself on a throne to judge others in order to feel secure or admired or loved. Because I find it in Jesus. I find it in his love. Can I give some quick things to, to go on this journey? Because there's miracle moments and God might have a miracle moment for you today. In fact, I suspect he does for many of us where he's just gonna unlock something and he's gonna begin to heal hearts in this place. But then he invites us onto a journey of discipleship to work out that healing, to work out that revelation. It's, it's, it's rarely just a miracle moment and it's done. It's God intervenes and then he asks us to walk in the journey of discipleship with him. So let me give you some things. If you want to dethrone yourself, the first thing you need to do is enthrone Jesus. It feels quite obvious, doesn't it? Um, but this is what our worship is. This is why we're passionate about worshiping Jesus in this space. This is why we, we worship for a good amount of time. This is why all our songs are directed towards him about who he is, about exalting him in our lives and over this church and over this city. We enthrone Jesus and as we do so, we dethrone ourselves. Jesus is the most important person in the room. Whatever room you go into, whatever boardroom, whatever living room, 
Jesus is the most important person in the room. And, and, and when we direct our gaze and our hearts and our, our humility towards him in that kind of way, we begin to dethrone ourselves and enthrone him. So enthrone Jesus. Don't let Sunday mornings be the only time that you passionately worship Jesus, church. Secondly, submit to God's word. Hebrews 4 verse 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. We want to dethrone ourselves and, and dig deep into what is going on inside of us. We need to turn to the word of God, not for information, but for it to judge the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. Uh, some people at the start of this year uh, did a, a, a Bible shred. Anybody heard of a Bible shred before? I hadn't before this year. It's basically to read the whole of scripture in 30 days. That's full on. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, that is amazing. If I'm honest, the times when I've read the whole of the Bible in one year, just a whole year, um, even then I can find myself just being like, I just need to get through scripture. I just need to get through a number of chapters in a day. And actually there's something really good about that. There's something really good about being like, okay, I'm going to soak myself in this story. I'm going to let it get into every part of my, my thinking and, and to rewrite the narrative of my heart. But we also need to read this word slowly and prayerfully and allow it to judge the attitudes and the thoughts of our hearts. To sit in a couple of verses or a story and, and just to ask, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? It's an old practice called Lectio Divina. If you're not aware of it, Google it and practice it. It's, it's prayerfully reading scripture in order to allow the spirit to speak to your heart. Lectio Divina. Submit yourself to God's word. Thirdly, lean into community. Lean into community. I can tell you, I can say to you today, I genuinely believe I'm more in love with Jesus than I've ever been since becoming his friend aged four, 33 years ago. I think I'm more in love with him than I've ever been. And honestly, you are all a big part of the reason for that. Community is. The people that you walk with, the people that you, that sharpen you and you sharpen them, the, the people you spark off their love and off their, their passion and off their faith. I want to think that you could put me anywhere in the world and I would be a passionate follower of Jesus. I want to think that me and Jesus is enough. But you were built for community. Husbands and wives, I mean, sometimes do a sandwich of feedback. Say something nice as well as... But we're actually called to, to disciple one another, to speak life over one another, to, to keep pointing each other to Jesus. Uh, friendships, single people in this place, do you have intentional relationships where they're pointing you towards Jesus? And can I say this, actually, in digging deep, one of the best things you can do is actually not just to point out other people's issues, <laughs> but to draw out the gold in them, to speak words of life and encouragement to people. And it's amazing how some of the dross gets burnt away as we recognize what God has put within us. This kind of community, this, it's costly and it's vulnerable, but it's so needed. It's essential for our discipleship. And finally, before we pray, can I encourage you, keep returning to the cross. Keep returning to the cross. The cross is this place that, that dethrones us. It's really hard for me to sit on a judgment seat above somebody else when I've just sat at the foot of the cross and recognize it's my sin that has put Jesus there. But also, I find that I deceive myself or I'm deceived in both ends of the spectrum. And the, the cross, it draws us to the truth of who God says we are. We don't have to be on the throne, but we also don't have to 
to wallow in the miry pit of self-pity. Because in the cross, we are more loved than we could ever imagine being. In the cross, we find that his love is is higher than anything that could set itself up against us. Any power or authority, any accusation, his love is higher. At the cross, we discover his love is deeper. (laughs) It goes to the very depths of who we are and it knows our deepest darkness and yet it loves us even in that place. At the cross, we recognize that its, its length is further. It's got no end, no matter what happens, his love towards you will never cease. And at the cross, we discover that his love is broader, it's wider, It reaches every person, even me, even you. And so come to the cross. Come in your humility and in your brokenness and receive his love. Shall we stand to our feet, church?